Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. So when I read Egyptian history, I often become very envious of the fact that we actually have the bodies of many of the people who were protagonists in Egyptian history, uh, you know, mummies of pharaohs and such, and we can we can examine their health, we can see what they died of. Uh, historical reconstructions sometimes rely on the evidence provided by the bodies of the people involved in the events. These events that happened thousands and thousands of years before anything in Byzantium. Some of these mummies still go on medical checkups. <laughs> they get on an airplane, they go to another country where there's some specialist, and you know they have their stomachs examined, they, the dentists examine them. It's, it's kind of interesting. Obviously, we don't have anything like that for Byzantium. Uh, we can't get very close to the individuals um, who we know from narrative sources. Uh, occasionally, we might have an uh, autograph manuscript, their signature, um, a, a ring or a seal that they used, may have handled at some point, probably did, but that's about as close as we can get to known historical individuals. One possible exception is Tsar Samuel um, of the Bulgarian Empire, um, the one who was defeated by Basil II. I believe his body was found uh, in the church of uh, St. Achilles in the Prespes uh, Lakes. Uh, I don't know that any uh, detailed analysis has been undertaken um, of that, though the pattern of the silk in which he was wrapped when he was buried uh, has been made into uh, a ties. <laughs> I have one of those ties. I bought it at a museum at some point. Okay, enough about him. But what if we're not primarily interested in known individuals? We do have a number of bodies or skeletal remains of Byzantines, from uh, the, especially from the provinces, people whose names we don't know, but whose bodies are found in the course of excavations, uh, either of cemeteries um, or other sites where events happen, like battles and so on, where people died. So skeletal analysis has recently become a, a larger and larger part of the study of ancient history. There's so much that we can learn about people from their skeletal remains. For example, uh, where they were from. Uh, did, did they move, especially after childhood? Uh, so dental records can tell us about that. So that helps in studying patterns of migration. Um, how tall were they? Now there's a specialized bibliography about how you reconstruct a person's height in life from their skeletal remains. But the conclusions are sometimes interesting. So for example, it's been proposed that people were generally shorter during the Roman Empire than before or after. And why is that? Is is it because they were living more oppressive lives during the Roman Empire? So were the taxes so heavy that they didn't have enough surplus to grow fully? Um, was it the lead that was <laughs> such a big part of the Roman economy? So there's lead in the air everywhere. They're inhaling particulates. You know, people don't grow to their full height. Um, we can tell generally what kinds of proteins they were eating, so what was their diet like, uh, when were they weaned um, in childhood from breast milk to um, other nutrients. Um, so these are all sort of very fascinating areas. Another one is their diseases. Now, how much pain were they in from certain kinds of diseases that leave a uh, record um, uh, on their bones? My guest today is Krisa Vurvu. Uh, who is a bioarchaeologist and paleopathologist at the Greek Ministry of Culture um, and is very involved in analyzing and studying skeletal remains that are found uh, in Byzantine sites in, in, in Greece, uh, particularly in Crete, uh, but also in other places. And she's written a number of articles and a book where her emphasis is on understanding the health um, of the Byzantine provincial population, um, as we can reconstruct it from their skeletal remains. Her research, as all research, can be technical, um, but uh, I asked her here to present um, her findings and, and methods um, in, in a more accessible terms so that you can all follow. But for those of you who are versed in the lingo, 
I, uh, I encourage you to follow up uh, from her, um, especially her book, which I'll list in the description of this podcast episode. I should say that this is a whole new dimension of, of evidence and analysis that traditionally was sort of not part of graduate training in history, in, in ancient medieval history, um, but that we will have to and should uh, become more familiar with and adept at using because with advances in, in scientific uh, uh, methods and analysis and accessibility of, of these kinds of materials and as it's becoming more common to process findings this way, um, we're, we're going to have to start including uh, these findings more regularly into our research. And I find that quite thrilling. So here's my conversation with Risa, and also a shout out to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Hello, Risa. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Nice to join you today. <laughs> So let's start with some basics. What do you call your field? Because in your uh, articles, in your book, I came across a number of terms, and they're all fascinating terms. So I came across paleopathology, forensic anthropology, or skeletal biology, bioarchaeology, and funerary archaeologists. So what are you? Uh, I think I'm a little bit of all these. I know they all sound kind of exotic because usually, you know, people are like um, uh, very fascinated when they ask you what you are doing, and what are you working on? And you say, I'm an archaeologist. This is already cool. But when you start saying that, well, I have a specialization that has to do with the study of human skeletal remains, ah, this is the most exciting for everybody uh, part of the research. So basically, I would define myself, if you want, as a bioarchaeologist, because my background, um, saying the first um, degree I got was in archaeology from the University of Athens. And then I did my specialization in uh, the study of, of human skeletal remains in England and then back uh, to Greece. So basically, bioarchaeology is the study of human skeletal remains derived from archaeological context. And there, by studying these physical remains, the biological remains, we can have a lot of information about how people lived in the past. All other terms, like, for example, paleopathology, that uh, it's easy to understand that comes from the Greek words Paleos, which means old, and uh, pathos, uh, which uh, means, uh, uh, let's say, problem in a sense, uh, refers to the study of uh, ancient disease. This is uh, a field or, um, let's say, a subfield within uh, bioarchaeology. And then you have all these other, uh, let's say, kind of specializations as well. When we say funerary archaeology, we mean that um, uh, people, researchers, are mostly into the study of uh, burials, graves, cemeteries, and in, in the sense that the, they are, um, let's say, interested in the context of death. Um, the excavation of the burials, architecture, type of graves, um, uncompanying goods and everything, but also uh, now integrating the study of human skeletal remains. Right. So, so in terms of uh, like movies and TV culture, you're something between Tomb Raider and CSI Byzantium. Yeah, it, it could be. Yeah, it could be something like that. Uh, let's say uh, Byzantine bones, perhaps. Byzantine <laughs> bones. Yes, there you go. That's <laughs> It's a good one. Um, but, so you've probably taken, you, you have some background in um, me medical science or certainly pathology, right? Medical pathology. Uh, well, I during the, the master course we did uh, ages ago, I, I, I don't even remember when, <laughs> we did a training uh, basically in uh, human osteology and um, anatomy, but uh, as far as uh, to the musculature, the muscle system, uh, we are not, let's say, so specialized as our fellow colleagues who work on mummies. Because in mummy studies, you have soft tissue, 
Right. And so the preservation is fantastic. So you get also, let's say, a lot of organs still preserved, uh, almost intact. And there you really need to have a more um, specialized biology, medical background. So That's right. I mean, they still have like bacterial cultures that are alive in some of these things, right? And, uh, they well, the good, the good and fascinating things with mummies is that they can offer you all this material to be examined in many ways. Uh, we we only have bones, mm. uh, sometimes not very well preserved, but still we can do a lot of type of analysis beyond the macroscopic examination. That means what you can see with the naked eye. Yeah. You can proceed with a very specific chemical or molecular analysis now. So at what point in an excavation do you get called in or, or are you part of the excavation team from the start? Because I'm interested in when it comes to so finding the bones, how are they handled and what is their trajectory through the research process and where do they end up? Well, um, let's say that the ideal would uh, have been that a um, specialist in human bones is uh, present from the beginning of the excavation. Uh, sometimes you already know that you are going to excavate a cemetery site. So there in your plan, you have to incorporate someone who is specialist in digging up and studying the bones. But sometimes we all know that in archaeology, uh, we come up uh, with discoveries that are not expected. So perhaps uh, you are excavating a, a domestic uh, site and suddenly you come across uh, some uh, burials on the floor of the houses. So there you call the specialist. It's like, who are you gonna call? <laughs> you are <laughs> going to <laughs> So there we go. And uh, sometimes we take part uh, in, in the excavation uh, or just give the guidelines to uh, our fellow archeologists already at the site, how to do the excavation, for example, to um, pay specific attention in parts of the skeletons that are very uh, helpful in uh, uh, estimating the age or the sex of the individual. So to very carefully excavate this part, sometimes to take uh, uh, soil samples from distinctive parts of the skeleton in, in order to proceed to other type of analysis, more specialized later in the lab. Um, and after that, when the, the skeleton is um, carefully removed from the soil, it is transported to the lab and there begins our job to examine uh, the, the skeleton, examine the bones and see what information we can get about this person, who was this person in, in life. And these labs are, there, there's university labs or Ministry of Culture labs or... Uh, it, it depends. There are projects in universities that are uh, responsible for excavating and study the um, human skeletal material that comes uh, from the excavation. But of course, when you work with the Ministry of Culture in, in Greece, you have a lot of uh, uh, excavations um, regarding um, cemetery sites. There, we don't really have a specialized lab for doing this analysis. It can be any conservation lab or it can be any reserved place within the installation of um, our department. So right. to study the material. Okay, and so let's skip past the lab just for a second because I'm curious as to where skeletal remains go when you're done with the analysis. They stay within the store rooms of the museum, in most of the cases. Uh, sometimes, uh, very rarely, when it comes to museum exhibitions, we can see some of them uh, presented to the public. Uh, this is a big uh, issue now, uh, um, if and how we should uh, present mm -hmm. human skeletal remains to the public. And um, I think it's, uh, it's really worth it to uh, have this type of attempt, meaning to present human skeletal remains to the public, but in a way that um, it can really uh, give a sense to the past. 
I, I think that presenting a skeleton in a, in a museum gives you a, an idea of the past that you cannot have beyond uh, any other type of archaeological evidence. Let's say that having a human skeleton um, on display, you give face to the past. So rarely, but I think we should a little bit promote this idea of exposing um, our uh, uh, centers in, in a way that uh, it's ethical and engaging to the public. It's something that really is worth doing. Yeah. But the what majority you, of them... If I can ask, so what are the arguments against doing that? Because you said there's a debate. It's, it's not actually a debate. It is actually a rise in ethical concerns regarding if uh, we can expose only for a scientific means to present the results of, of, an, of a study, uh, human skeletons or human remains in general. And um, if we are justified only by this um, uh, argument to present them, um, I would say that if you do this type of presentation to the public in the sensitive, not uh, uh, sensualized way, morbid mm. way, uh, it's uh, really worth doing. And if, um, for example, um, you do this in a way that uh, you avoid the morbid env environment over vulgarization, mm, right. okay, yeah, uh, yeah. then then you can achieve uh, uh, to present um, human remains as individuals and not as objects. Because okay. this is really the base of the arguments that uh, um, human remains cannot be presented as objects or as any archaeological objects. They are people. Um, it, it's not um, that they represent people. They are actually they are, Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can easily see how they could become exploited or sensationalized uh, yes. and treated disrespectfully and, and so on. Exactly, because uh, I think that um, at least most public surveys in, in museums um, give a very positive feedback. When people see a human remains in museum, they want to see it. And uh, sometimes they also uh, feel in the commentaries that they are cheated if they don't see a real skeleton and they see a replica. So uh, there is some point there that people really are fascinated by uh, the look uh, to the face with the past, with an individual from the past. Yeah, it's I remember it. That was, yeah. As a child, I was slightly disappointed when I found out that all of those dinosaur bones aren't actually bones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fossil replica. <laughs> but... Exactly. So imagine that the, uh, with uh, dinosaur bones, you get uh, this uh, feeling and people also get it with actual human bones that they prefer to see than to see a, a mannequin or a model instead of the human uh, skeleton. Right. That, right. Uh, now this is this is a really nice area to uh, invest a little bit of uh, work because I think uh, um, let's say sometimes when we work in our uh, nice and uh, quiet uh, academic uh, environment we forget the public and it's really nice to uh, diffuse the knowledge in um, scientific journals and in books which uh, are mostly for a specialized audience but I think the most important audience is the public and um, this is why our uh, field by archaeologists need really to speak out about what they are doing. Yeah and I realize now that we're speaking that you face so many different fronts so you're facing the excavation you're facing the lab you're facing the museum and you're facing yeah. academic um, audiences through your publication so that's your wow <laughs> it's just around experience um, all right so let's get back to the lab now so what kinds of conditions pathologies or disabilities have you diagnosed from Byzantine skeletal remains so basically by working many years uh, on human skeletal remains from Byzantine sites, I didn't really come across with a super wow diseases. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes you really find 
let's say, a little bit of extraordinary cases that you can say during the examination of the bonds, wow, this is really cool. But I would say that um, I came across the humble people of uh, the Byzantine period. This means that uh, I came across usually a lot of dental diseases, the stuff that we are suffering today, caries, um, um, tartar or calculus, as we say, uh, an abscessed tooth, all this uh, type of um, pathologies that we are not very happy to, to have today and we all avoid to go to our uh, dental appointment. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of, of uh, arthritic changes that again uh, is uh, something that we all know today that uh, people usually of older age are suffering because arthritis usually is associated mostly with um, the tear and wear of our joints that comes with age. Uh, sometimes I had some cases of arthritic changes that comes, as we say, second to a trauma. Means that you had a fractured bone uh, that did not heal well and uh, induced some arthritic changes to uh, the associated uh, joints uh, of the bone. Uh, so other um, diseases um, included uh, what we call infections that can be of a specific nature or of a non-specific nature. This means that when is of speci specific nature, we really know the causative agent that introduced the infection. When we cause of non-specific infections, um, it means that we cannot really um, and identify the um, causative agent that introduced this type of infection. Uh, some of the most common type of infections that I came across are what we call periostitis, which is kind of mild infection that you can usually see on the log bones like the tibia. And uh, it is a, a type of infection that affects this um, thin membrane that surrounds all our bones and it's called the periosteum. This is why it's called periostitis. Uh, if it stays there in this, uh, let's say, uh, thin membrane that covers the bone, it's okay, but sometimes the um, causative agent that can be a bacterium can go inside the bone. And then we have more severe cases, which are called like osteomyelitis because it gets to mm -hmm. the uh, uh, interior of the bone. Um, this, uh, this type of infections, um, when it comes to, let's say, pre-antibiotic times, uh, they were certainly very fatal. So perhaps uh, me as um, a specialist seeing this type of uh, osteomyelitis and say, okay, wow, this is another osteomyelitis, nothing really much. But for people back in, in that time, it was a fatal condition because the bacteria can spread in the whole system of the body. You don't have antibiotics to fight back and then death can uh, easily and um, very uh, we, with no uh, problem appear you know yeah and, and, and these, these would have been inv invisible like they wouldn't have known where this was coming from right? um i'm not sure if they didn't really know because for example uh, if they had a, a, a wound a trauma uh they they had all this let's say basic and uh, medical knowledge of how to treat a trauma, uh, how to align a fractured bone, but um, their remedies and uh, their, uh, let's say, instruments, medical instruments at the time were not sufficient to fight back uh, a type of bacterial infection. infection. Definitely they had um, uh, um, plants, that uh, they could uh, turn into and prepare specific uh, remedies that they could use um, to clean the wound or, or uh, 
to uh, ease the pain or something like that, but we cannot see the efficacy in, in the sense we can understand it today. And the same holds to truth if, uh, for example, you have an infected tooth. Again, today, uh, with a very strong uh, I, I, antibiotic, it's okay, you can uh, mm -hmm. deal with it. But in the past, even a simple thing as an infected tooth can lead to the death of uh, an yeah, individual. Yeah. So you've yeah. come across individuals who suffered severe trauma and survived, and, and you can tell that they survived. And, yes. And other people who succumbed to it. I mean, have you found people who experienced some major accident and, and died from it? Uh, well, basically, the majority of the um, uh, fractures that I, I have uh, so far seen, uh, they can be associated with um, everyday accidents. People are clumsy, uh, falling down. So you can see, for example, um, a specific type of fractures to the radius, our uh, um, bone in the arm, that uh, you can break when you fall down and you just put your hands right. on, on the right. soil to, fall, to support yeah. yourself. This is a very common fracture that you can uh, come across and it's called the Coles fracture. Um, actually, you can identify um, a, a fractured bone because uh, um, most of the times you still have some evidence of the callus formation. The callus formation is uh, what happens at uh, exactly after the bones are broken into two, new uh, cells are surrounding the bones that are fractured in order to put them back together. And this callus sometimes is um, visible still in uh, the bones that we see. Sometimes it is well healed meaning that uh, only slight traces are still visible, but sometimes you can also see complications. For example, that the two broken parts are not put back together in the right place. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have like a, um, a pseudo arthrosis, they are united in the wrong place, in the wrong way. And this has to do with uh, how much uh, the person continue to move the arm. Um, and this can make us think that, for example, a, a fracture that was not really nicely healed, a person using the arm had no other choice but to use it. It has to go back to the field. Right. It has to go back to take care of the animals. It, it has to continue life because he didn't have the luxury to, to stay sure. uh, mobile for uh, essential workers. Yeah. Yeah. And can you tell uh, the difference between a naturally uh, a break that healed naturally and something that was cured by a saint through a miracle? Or is that not visible? In uh, no, it's not possible. But uh, returning to your yeah. question, uh, um, uh, what type of injuries I, I have seen, I could say that uh, some type of fracture, they could be also the result of uh, violent attacks. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, fractures that are mostly on the head uh, and the head or the chest are like the primary areas that you can uh, attack a person. Um, and some of the wounds I have seen in the head, they were like minor. Uh, someone either hit uh, the head on an uh, uneven surface or it was hidden by a fellow human, but uh, not in a mean way in order to produce the death of this individual. In other cases, we do have some um, uh, evidence where a very sharp uh, instrument like perhaps a sword or a knife was used and um, uh, a big cut at the back of the head uh, of the skull was produced. So basically this type of, uh, of fracture is um, fatal uh, and by examining the bones, you can actually see that there was no healing procedure so mm -hmm. it was like 
immediate and uh, but the, uh, i didn't really come across let's say um this type of burials that can be associated with um, um, violent uh, incident like a war, like uh, an episode of war, like a battle or something that there you can usually have a lot of uh, fractures. Of, right, right. Or, or an execution where maybe someone was no. decapitated or, no. or, or a body full of metal spikes to prevent them from rising as a vampire. It <laughs> wasn't that. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, by the way, so you're speaking of skulls, just last week, so I was reading uh, Archaeology magazine, I, I read it over breakfast, um, and just last week it said that um, a skull was found on Thassos that uh -huh. from the four, between the 4th and the 7th century, and it says that the a surgeon at that time, so early Byzantine period, tried to perform a complex procedure that entailed boring holes into the skull. Ah, trepanation. Yeah, I mean, was this used commonly in Byzantium? And what was it used for? Well, it's not only Byzantium. This is a procedure that uh, dates back to prehistoric times. I know there's some Egyptian and, cases uh, too. Yes, yeah. uh, we have uh, examples from all over the world. It's not like uh, you can find it only in Greece or only in South America. You find it all over the world. And it is, um, let's say, a surgical operation that is still practiced today by a tribe in Kenya. So uh, in, in the sense that this uh, tribe continues to perform this type of surgical operation in the old fashioned way, because trepanation as a um, complicated surgical procedure is very well known today in the neuroscience. But uh, when you use blades or sharp stones or, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, surgical um, uh, tools that are not so um, sophisticated like today, uh, you still have these tribes in Kenya that are using this type of uh, material. Why was this procedure performed? Okay, uh, the main reason is to release the intracranial pressure that uh, a, a wound, a trauma to the head could cause. So if you had a trauma to the head, in order to decompose the pressure of the blood accumulation and everything inside the head, mm -hmm. they were performing this type of holes uh, to release this intracranial uh, pressure. Um, from uh, the skeletal record, we do have a lot of um, cases that are also um, uh, showing us that trepanation was uh, used to cure other types of diseases as well. For example, we have a case of um, um, vitamin C deficiency, scurvy, uh, to um, a child, and uh, the skull also had um, traces of uh, attempts of trepanation perhaps because they thought that they could cure this um, lack of uh, vitamin uh, by uh, refining uh, the skull. Um, in, in other cases, we also have uh, um, a case of a child which uh, was hydrocephalus. We know this um, um, congenital uh, uh, malformation that you are born with a big uh, skull because um, it is uh, due to the accumulation of the um, fluid in, in mm -hmm. the brain. So another attempt of trepanation was for uh, this type of uh, congenital uh, malformation. Uh, but there is also indication that, for example, uh, this type of uh, surgical operation was performed for, let's say, magical religious uh, reasons, mm. uh, in the sense that the for example, some um, people uh, possessed uh, by a devil or a diseased spirit, uh, it will be uh, a solution to open a hole in the head and release the spirit. Uh, and this was um, very common uh, as a procedure also in antiquity or in Byzantine times to have this type of magical religious association to help people uh, relieve the, the disease uh, spirit. It's like um, 
I don't know if you know this a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, the, the Stone of Folly, which um, it is a, a 16th century um, medieval painting showing the uh, performing of uh, a trepanation. And this um, painting is known because it's um, also uh, under the title, The Stone of Folly. So basically the trepanation was for removing this um, sense of disease, the spirit, evil spirit, madness, to cure people from uh, this type of um, disease that can be um, connected with or associated with mental disorders. Yeah. But this type of, um, uh, let's say, um, reasoning for performing trepanation is not very obvious in archaeological material. Right. Um, usually you have uh, some type of uh, pathology that perhaps can be associated. If you have a head trauma, this is definitely one of the reasons that trepanation can be done. But um, in other cases, it's not really easy to identify. So I was struck by your mention of uh, scurvy because it comes up in some of your articles in your book too. And I oh. think you, you even have a sentence somewhere where you say, it's not entirely clear how you get scurvy when you're living on like Crete. Yeah. How, how is this possible? Like, I thought this is for, for pirates in the Caribbean or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I think that uh, the side when we first um, uh, found these uh, cases of scurvy, it, it is like the, the biggest paradox of all. It is a very small village outside Hanya in, in Crete, when today it is known for having uh, very big plantations of orange trees. <laughs> <laughs> so, and basically mm -hmm. the church where we excavated the cemetery, it is surrounded by these orange trees. So when I came across the case of scurvy, I was really saying, this is really sad because so many centuries back, people suffered from scurvy, and today around the church is a big yard full of orange trees and citrus fruit in general. Yeah, sad. So, well, uh, vitamin C is uh, very vital for uh, our body, and it takes part for uh, many body functions. One of them uh, is, uh, for example, the formation of collagen. And uh, one that we all know more is uh, that it uh, strengths our immune system. So it is uh, a very vital vitamin for a healthy organism to, um, to have. Um, how can you have scurvy? Uh, basically, you can have scurvy because you don't eat a lot of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables because perhaps you are on a very uh, strict or specific diet that is based, uh, for example, on cereals. Cereals lack of vitamin C. They don't have a lot of vitamin C. Uh, perhaps um, the, um, the way you are preparing the food by overboiling destroy any possible vitamin C that can be in uh, um, the different food products. Uh, but when we are discussing about vitamin C in, in kids, it can come in two forms, let's say. One can be what we call like the neonatal scurvy, which means that as soon as um, in birth, the, the newborn suffers from scurvy, from the lack of vitamin C. Uh, how can you have a newborn with um, scurvy? It is because ma the mother was already deficient. So as we know, uh, the fetus in the womb takes all uh, essential nutrition from the mother through the placenta. Mm -hmm. If the mother is deficient in vitamins like vitamin C, 
baby gets also deficient in vitamin C. If uh, a, a deficient mother uh, lactates, the breastfeeds the baby and doesn't have the necessary amount of vitamin C, the baby also gets uh, deficient. But in older children, these cases of uh, neonatal scurvy are, let's say, a little bit more uh, rare. But the other types of scurvy, uh, when it comes to children, they can be associated with the type of diet. And when we talk about the diet, we mostly talk about the type of food are given to kids after they stop breastfeeding. And uh, in um, times like uh, Byzantine times or in antiquity as a whole, uh, we know that uh, most preparations that has to do with uh, this type of weaning foods were based on uh, cereal preparations. And as we have already said, cereals lack the uh, vitamin C. So these children that uh, we found suffering from uh, um, uh, vitamin C deficiency, although lived uh, in an environment that uh, a lot of fresh fruits uh, could be available, uh, they develop most probably the disease because of the type of diet they had as uh, children. Yeah, now you've also talked about when Byzantine children were weaned, right, from uh, breast milk. And I think it you concluded that it's somewhat later than we might expect? Yes. It, not later than we ex expect. Uh, it is um, the pattern that we see in different times across medieval sites in Europe that it is a different. In, in Greece, we have, let's say, so far, a late pattern around three years old. After the age of three years, uh, we see that uh, milk, mother's milk, stop uh, being uh, um, the major component of a child's diet. Uh, but we have other medieval sites across Europe that they have an earlier, earlier time for weaning, perhaps around one, one and a half or maximum two years old. And um, these type of patterns, we don't really know how we see this type of differences. We really need to um, compare in between more samples to see if there is actually a pattern between, right. let's say, Western medieval Europe or Eastern medieval Europe, if, for example, um, uh, countries or sites in Greece or the Eastern Mediterranean follow more or less the um, late antique pattern where we have a more um, prolonged um, lactation period. Um, what's, the significance, what's the significance of the difference? I mean, what does it mean for people's health or society? Or um, what um, means for children themselves is uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, more exposed uh, to diseases because uh, the, um, uh, while they are breastfed, they get all the immunity needed uh, from um, the uh, nutrition that uh, the mother's milk is uh, providing. So they are in a way more secure. Uh, then when they start uh, eating all these uh, type of foods that, for example, compose the adult diet, they don't have the system already adapted uh, to this type of uh, food. And uh, sometimes the food can be contaminated uh, with uh, pathogenic agents. For example, if the milk that they are given or the meat they are given it's not very well cooked, they can very well develop any kind of infectious diseases. Right. So uh, an early weaning um, is, a, let's say, a critical period. Already weaning is a critical period because uh, the, the organism, the system of the child try to adapt to different type of foods. 
and this is uh, why it is uh, um, a very difficult period and uh, the children uh, suffer from um, side effects like diarrhea and uh, stuff like that. So already a difficult time and if the type of food uh, adherent or given to, to the child are not adequate or um, uh, very well cooked in, in the sense uh, to yeah. secure from uh, any um, type of infections. So we talked about mothers. Have you found any general patterns in the distribution of pathologies between men and women? Um, I didn't find this type of uh, big changes in between male or female uh, uh, skeletons in the distribution pattern of the most commonly, uh, let's say, observed diseases. Sometimes you get a little bit uh, higher percentage of uh, male fractures, for example, or mm -hmm. male arthritic changes that can be associated with uh, perhaps the lifestyle or the um, um, work that they were engaged that, that could be more demanding. And this is why they are developing, let's say, in earlier uh, ages, this type of uh, arthritic changes or they are accumulating the type of fractures that uh, we see. Uh, but uh, apart from that, um, with the same available so far, I don't really see big difference that could be alarming that, for example, uh, uh, women were at risk uh, or um, um, male were more uh, in living in more favorable conditions. The truth is that there is a um, uh, a difference in um, the average mean of age at death and uh, women have uh, uh, a lesser um, age at death at around 35 years old, let's say. And I suppose sometimes we see a lot of uh, young women entering the bioarchaeological record due to complications in childbirth. Sure. Yeah, so from this point of view, uh, you have some differences seen in the mean age at the death. And when you see a lot of more young um, women entering this uh, death cohort, um, could be justified or explained by complications in pregnancy or childbirth. You know, this is a fascinating area of research, and I'm really happy that it's possible these days because, like, even 20 years ago, this was almost science fiction. Oh, yeah. We've done very, very little, right? And, you know, the first time I was exposed to this type of research was about, it was really about 17 years ago. I was reading some papers on skeletal analysis of the people who were buried in the Mycenaean tombs. The, uh -huh. the tombs, right? And I was, because I was teaching a course on the, on the Bronze Age then. And I was struck by, so this was grave circle B, which is yeah. the earlier one of the two. So yeah. the earlier Mycenaean kings, I don't know, 15th century BC and, or, or 16th. And I was struck by the, the conclusions, which were that the kings were actually, they bore wounds on the left side of their body, which indicates a right-handed opponent yeah. was striking them, right? But I was also struck by the statement that the bones revealed an excessive musculature. Mm. In other words, that these kings were sort of ripped, right? Like they, they lived the Homeric lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but now you say that inferring musculature from skeletal remains is kind of risky and can lead to misunderstandings. So can you clear up my Mycenaean warrior? King? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Why do you well, say that? Uh, I, I say this because... Um, I think sometimes we make uh, uh, a lot of uh, the data available. Uh, this means that we are um, giving uh, uh, interpretations or assumptions uh, by over analyzing the type of um, um, observation we make on the bones. It is true that um, uh, you can see signs of the um, uh, muscle attach attachments on the bones. 
And um, of course, there are individuals who are engaged into very strenuous activities that are using uh, continuously uh, on a daily basis very hard their bones and muscles. And this is why sometimes we find on the skeleton these marks of the musculature very uh, nicely on, on the bones. And then we can say that the individual was like very robust, that uh, he was um, a gay engaged in a heavy activities most of his life uh, and all that stuff. Up to this point, and when using specific indexes, uh, specific metrics, uh, specific calculations, you can really say a lot of things regarding how these individuals were exercising their bones and muscles. But from this point to arrive and say, for example, because uh, someone has a very strong elbow joint or a musculature in the arms was a weaver, or oh, a I see. Archer, okay, okay. Or riding a horse because um, uh, the femur had uh, some musculature that was really, really robust. Right. So this is the key and, and the tricky part. Um, it is um, today we can say this. For example, uh, um, today we have uh, the tennis elbow which is a, a, a lesion known to all people and especially athletes playing tennis because they are doing this repetitive move all the time. Mm, right. But uh, we have the patient in front of us. We have all his medical uh, history right, and record. Right. And uh, when we see these uh, lesions on the elbow and the guy tells us that he plays tennis, okay, we can make the association. Mm. But uh, with uh, the, um, uh, the bones, the dry bones, it's a little bit difficult and a little bit dangerous to get or to jump to this type of conclusions. I don't say that it is not possible. It is. But uh, many of this type of interpretation are really lightly given. I you know? Yeah. So it's, it's better to... Uh, really give a very scientific evaluation of the lesions you observe, how they can associate it, because our work sometimes is based on uh, modern clinical practice. So we yeah. have to, yeah. to see and, and study all this uh, in, in a sense to understand this type of lesion today, what would have been and perhaps can help us do the connection, you know? So no cases of uh, Tsinganistiri on elbow? Uh, no, <laughs> so far. Uh, sorry, for the audience, that's a type of Byzantine polo. Uh, very yeah. popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all right, so we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you a couple of some more general questions, uh, just in closing. So were the Byzantines in a lot of pain? I mean, when you think back on this society, do you sort of shake your head and say, those poor people, I mean, the, just from the dental records and their arthritis and so on? Um, yes, I, I would say that um, uh, today by archaeology has a new subfield, which is called the bioarchaeology of care or the bioarchaeology of personhood. So, in this, let's say, subfield of bioarchaeology, the main scope is to identify how individuals who suffered um, a very uh, difficult medical were given care by uh, their close environment, their family, or the society as a whole, and how this can be uh, significant for understanding how societies functioned in, in the past. Because providing care means that the society has the means and thinks of providing this type of care to individuals in need. Um, this uh, idea of the bioarchaeology of care to me applies 
in, in general when I do bioarchaeology, in the sense that uh, I think that um, we cannot really estimate the amount of suffering, these type of conditions that today are in a way more treatable, caused to the Byzantine people. Um, for example, uh, as we said, we, you have a toothache, you go to the dentist, it is still painful, you still want to avoid it, but uh, at the end you have a lot of possibilities to be treated. In the past, you even had the possibility to die. Mm -hmm. So there is a big difference there. Today, our arthritis and um, many other conditions that can cause disability or impairment are um, very well known to affect billions of people worldwide. In the past, having a fractured bone was a significant type of disability because means that you have to stay at home and not go to work. Um, or on the contrary, you have to go to work and you cannot stay at home. And then perhaps your fracture cannot heal very well. And then you are suffering a whole life right. with a not very nicely healed wound that you could avoid because, okay, the key uh, feature for a good healing is to immobilize the affected bone. But if you cannot, you continue walk, go working and then the fracture does not heal well. And then you stay with this fractured and maybe even disabled arm for a lot of time. So, or even the whole, your whole life. So I think that yes, uh, people in antiquity or in Byzantium, uh, uh, suffered from things that today are not uh, considered as major a source of, uh, let's say, pain. Um, but um, on the contrary, they are more or less in a way treated. Um, it's, it's, it's not very easy to, to judge how life was in the past because we seem to judge it with um, our Western uh, eyes and Western minds. And um, it, it, sometimes I really think that perhaps they, they lived very difficult lives and it is obvious on their bones that they live this type of lives. Uh, but other times perhaps um, they, they did not. Just um, uh, the idea is that we cannot uh, romanticize the past, you know, we, we cannot say that, oh, back in old days, everything nice. was really nice and really cool. And the atmosphere was really nice and clean. Well, this you can tell to the people who worked in the mining fields uh, in right. Jordan and uh, uh, chemical analysis on their bones found that, that they had a lot of, of uh, um, toxicity from lead. Lead, so, yes. I, I've recently yeah. been reading about that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's not uh, an, an about idea, idealizing um, uh, the past. Uh, it's uh, about how we can interpret it but always in, in a way that it's not obscured by our Western view of um, how life should have been or yeah, must yeah. be. Or beyond Western, just the, uh, the interventions of public health measures that we take for granted. We, we don't think about the fluoride in the water and you know, mass yeah. uh, you know, vaccinations and things like this, that um, setting the year 2020 aside, <laughs> right? For the this moment. is a black hole uh, in our, I think it, it is a, a year that we all need to delete. Yes. <laughs> Maybe, I think, let's uh, have a positive uh, idea about this year in the sense that perhaps we cannot count in our birthday. I'm sorry, can, that we can't count it in what? I lost you there. In, in our birthdays, that uh, oh. in our 
Yeah, because it's a, it's a year that doesn't exist. So why to add it? <laughs> yeah, or we can just declare it over now and skip directly to you know 2021. Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, Krisa, thank you very much. Uh, this was very I informative. You. And your work as well has supplied this dimension to understanding of life uh, in, in Byzantium and pre-modern societies generally that I just find fascinating that I would never have gotten from the usual saints' lives and histories that I read. <laughs> and uh, so this is a this is a growing field, and it's becoming more and more integrated into our so regular humanistic scholarship. And I'm seeing your work cited more and more and more. So I, that's that's heartening. And congratulations to you, and thank you for all your work. Thank you.